Yeah, I just wanted to introduce our three speakers. Um, Brian Lamb is the Director of Innovation and Open Learning up at uh, Thompson Rivers University. Uh, John Festinger is a practicing lawyer and faculty member at the Center for Digital Media. And Will Engel is a strategist at, with uh, UBC's Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. Um, Brian, John, and Will are all leaders of education or open educational initiatives at their respective institutions. And their talk will focus on um, useful tools, approaches, and methods of collaboration that enable educators and learners to shape their open learning uh, experiences. So please join me in welcoming our speakers today. Thanks, and uh, I, I just want to thank the organizers of Open UBC for this uh, really amazing couple days of programming. I'm really flattered and honored and delighted to be here. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to try to hand things off to Will and uh, John uh, in a reasonably prompt fashion. I'm going to try to keep things on the ransom meter somewhere between 8 and 9 and hopefully not red, red line over 10. Um, but I might get into a bit of trouble because I kind of want to start by kind of pointing to an assertion. This was posted on Twitter by a woman named Audrey Waters. If you're not familiar with Audrey Waters, she is from, from my perspective, probably the most interesting and nuanced. Uh, she used to be, I used to think of her as a, the best ed tech journalist working in the field, and I'm starting to think she's one of the most interesting thinkers about education technology in the field. Uh, and she made this kind of snarky tweet at South by Southwest Education, and there was this very kind of heavily hyped panel where Bill Gates kind of sat up on a, uh, on a, on a stage and kind of pontificated about how there was no innovation in higher education whatsoever and what they desperately needed was Silicon Valley to kind of ride into the rescue. Um, and I, I think Audrey's point, it's in Twitter ETH, but essentially what I interpret this here is she took this phrase, you know, where Bill Gates kind of noted, well, yeah, you know, the people who actually kind of understand the teaching and learning aren't really involved with the actual software that people are running. These are kind of very divided functions. And I think Audrey's point is, yeah, that's a problem. And I'll take that as my starting point. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I have my issues with this technology that is called uh, learning management systems. I think the flag for me always is that we call these things learning management systems. I think we give away why we employ these systems. Um, we don't call them learning enhancement systems. We don't call them learning awesomeness systems. We call them learning management systems. And that's the, the set of priorities I think have been built in to that technology. Um, it's just a few things. I, I like that picture there because I think it kind of represents some of the things. They don't have to be this way with a learning management system. It's possible for a learning management system to post stuff to the open web, but it so rarely does. It's possible to have content persist and students be able to access it after they finish a course. But again, it so very rarely happens. Um, and I think, you know, so it's not the technology in this sense that I'm trying to cast aspersions on. Um, I've come to see learning management systems in higher education as maybe a necessary evil. Um, I'm not so sure about the necessary part. But I want to also point to, um, this is a, a fragment of an image that Paul showed this morning. And he was kind of talking about the funding cycle of how kind of public money goes into funding educational uh, resources. And I just want to, I kind of chopped a bit of the cycle out of it. That's why you kind of see that arrow coming in. I kind of come in at the end of it. But, you know, you know, content is only used at the grantee institution. The public does not know about education resources. The public is granted little or no reuse rights to the content. And as a result, we see slowed learning and a poor return on the public investments, which does underlie a lot of what we do here. Um, so I, you know, the, interestingly enough, I don't personally see this part of the equation as necessarily just a licensing and policy issue. The tools we choose and how we choose to employ them in many ways puts that cycle in as well. Um, I guess I just want to say one other piece too, which is I just kind of see the employment of certain types of technologies, and, and I can't say it more powerfully or more sharply than David Vogt did this morning, where he kind of made the point that unfortunately kind of these certain practices often lead us in a place where instruction ends up being in kind of this very A to B to C type of process. And again, that's not imposed by the technology, but I think it is guided by the technology. And as a result as well, 
you know, if we actually believe this stuff that we say, that we're in the middle of a knowledge revolution, this is the new information age, literacies are changing, and we think about the amount of time that we're asking students to engage with online technology, but we're asking them to do it with a technology they'll never see outside of an educational context, the opportunities to strike is being missed to be building out these online and media literacy skills while they are learning. Um, and I love this quote. <laughs> Anyone who's ever seen me give a talk, I think in the last five years has probably seen this quote. It's from a professor at the City University of New York. Oh, this is what I do when I... This is a guy using Windows for the first time. I'm stopping. Um, I, where he kind of talks about the use of an online open platform for teaching and learning. And I just love this line as kind of, I think, an educational technology objective. To gradually integrate into the school's general education curriculum the deep, critical examination of how digital tools are changing the way we think and live. And I'm going to try to show a few examples where I think technology support can actually guide us to that sort of conclusion. Um, I read a really, one of those pieces that kind of takes a lot of kind of disparate thoughts that I see in different places and kind of crystallized it for me um, by a technology writer named John Udell, who actually works for Microsoft. Um, he had this wonderful, couple wonderful phrases in this piece, which I linked to. He talked about the technologies that he's most interested in using right now, he actually calls trailing edge technologies. Sometimes I feel a little bit retro because I'm still up here 10 years later and I'm still talking about blogs and wikis. And I think sometimes I get a little uneasy, like, you know, maybe I should pick up a new trick or two. Um, but what Udell kind of makes the point is these so-called trailing edge technologies that I think maybe people have gotten a little tired of, or even though they never really have reached their full potential, actually have just this tremendous potential, in part because they are eminently hackable, they employ open standards that operate in many different contexts. Um, and he kind of suggests that in kind of in this uncertain world of education technology we're moving on, I think what he suggests are characteristics like blending local culture with global platforms, um, local culture with global platforms, um, packaging offerings for reuse, in other words, using tools and systems that make it really easy for people to reuse your stuff. And again, I'm going to show a couple examples where I see this stuff happening. Um, and I love this idea because, you know, having been part of so many educational technology projects within institutions, and this isn't just learning management systems, it's just any technology that you employ in an institutional system, there's going to be local damage that blocks outcomes. Um, so technologies that are relatively flexible and allow you to route around those inevitable uh, explosions that happen, uh, there's a real power to that. I don't have to talk today for once, and I'm sure those of you that heard me speak before are very glad I'm not going to talk about today, uh, UBC blogs, UBC wiki. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm hoping Will will cover some of that in his section. Um, the one thing I will say is, I, you know, I worked at UBC until a little more than a year ago, and I fully appreciated <laughs> the capacity and power that those tools brought to this community while I was here. Um, but I've only come to appreciate how important that capacity is to an institution since I went to a place that doesn't really have it. Um, and, 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 and my new institution isn't unique in this. Um, by my standard, there really are only four or five educational institutions that I think are actually capable of using these platforms effectively and deploying them to large student and faculty populations, which again, I find kind of surprising given the obvious advantages. So I'm gonna leave the UBC example uh, aside for now and kind of talk about what I've had to do as a result. So, I mean, we do have some IT support, but there's really no tradition of supporting these types of platforms at my new school. They don't really know what to do with it. Uh, and they're not necessarily convinced that there's any point in doing it. So I've been very grateful that some of the people um, in the world that I kind of interact with have um, set up this project called Reclaim Hosting. I should circle back. One of the things in that Jonathan Udell article that he, the concept, in addition to trail and edge technologies, he talked about the notion of creating user innovation toolkits, which again was one of those phrases where I just went, ooh, that's interesting. So again, instead of providing a service, 
or a deployed set of tools that are kind of defined in how you use them, you think about setting up a range of tools, essentially in a toolkit, and thinking about what do we do if we deploy those tools out and allow the users to decide which tools they want to use and how they use them. And how does that change what we think of as support? So this group, Reclaim Hosting, um, they took a very small Shuttleworth grant. I think it was less than $5,000. And they're essentially providing free hosting for anyone who wants it in the educational sphere. Um, that $12 only applies to the cost of your domain name. Um, and these tools are all open source. Um, they are all supported by a tool called Installatron, which with one click allows you to install WordPress, MediaWiki, um, some really powerful discussion board tools, um, own cloud, which is essentially like a Dropbox, an open source control Dropbox, uh, with a very, very powerful hosting framework. <laughs> This thing's been a lifesaver for me. Um, most of the projects I'm going to show you that I'm kind of working on now have been built on this framework because we didn't have the capacity uh, in-house, in so we were able to route around it. Uh, it's been a very powerful thing. Um, so the example I'm probably most excited about, and it's this kind of oddly named project, um, our MOOC. And uh, it doesn't really behave like a MOOC that I've ever seen anywhere else. And I'm not exactly sure why, why it's called our MOOC, other than I think the professor thought MOOCs were a cool thing. He kind of wanted to get on this wave. Essentially, what happened here was this instructor had a really amazing opportunity. There was a set of artist residencies happening at Thompson Rivers University last summer, uh, based around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And historically, a lot of these kind of events happen. People come on. There's this amazing kind of set of energies and people are doing art and then there's an art show at the end and people can go to the art show and then people kind of go their different ways the art gets dispersed and really maybe there's a bit of news coverage that happens but nothing really gets captured um, again I'm kind of on a familiar machine here so I'm having a bit of trouble so what he wanted to do was create means to allow people to capture this experience as easily and as powerfully and as flexibly as possible um, so, you, again, using the WordPress framework, okay, there were just so many different ways you can contribute to the site. So there was, you could have your own blog and just send the uh, syndication framework to people and it could work out that way. Um, he used a plugin that allowed users to contribute by email. So literally anyone who caught wind of this initiative anywhere in Canada, and there were people all over Canada who caught wind of it and wanted to participate, we didn't have to worry about giving them an account. Literally all we had to do was provide them this, this one secret email address, and when they posted to it, their subject line was the title, the media rendered beautifully, uh, and it formatted quite nicely. So people were able to contribute in this very flexible way. People's Twitter accounts with different hashtags were fed in well. Um, and anybody's uh, appropriately tagged Instagram or Flickr images also were fed into the site. And as a result, with very little, um, this is thing, I'm really not familiar with this machine. I'm usually fine on other people's machines. <laughs> um, able to just generate just huge amounts of media capturing this experience. Um, and it built this really tremendous momentum that was actually feeding the residency as it happened. One of the things that I thought was just really exciting about this, the uh, professor uh, described this as kind of a learning, uh, let me just get back to my initial set of links. I don't know if I might be frozen up here. Uh, okay, pardon me. One of the things that I found really exciting was that because of this really open structure, people were able to kind of catch me in the project and start to build into it. So a couple weeks in, this project in Saskatchewan, a reconciliation uh, project around a canoe trip, was able to be, they caught wind of it, they were already doing their own thing, but in just a few seconds, we were able to integrate what this site was doing and feed it into their material, and vice versa. The stuff from our MOOC was, was able to flow back. And the, there really was some wonderful stuff that came out of that, that community going back and forth. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just maybe leave that a bit. One of the things I loved about this framework, though, again, I, there's a very powerful tool. 
It worked really well. It worked great on mobile devices. People were able to contribute through all sorts of platforms. It was highly stable. I think it looks pretty good. Um, it was very inexpensive to do. And yes, there were some specific techniques in terms of how the, tech, uh, how the platform was deployed that were beyond the skill level of a typical WordPress beginner. But one of the wonderful things about it is we had Alan Levine who helped us build the site. He wrote this incredibly detailed recipe about how every single piece of the site was built, how he configured it. So he's not just sharing the code. He's not just sharing the site as an open site. He's really bringing out his process as well. And so I've been able to take this recipe that's been employed on this particular site and use it for a host of other projects that maybe aren't quite as ambitious as our MOOC but again, employ a lot of those same kind of frameworks. And so that, that's that element is where you do an experiment, and every time you do something new, you're not just doing something adventurous or having fun, you're actually building your capacity to improve your, thing, your, your work in the future, which I thought was really exciting. Um, I hope you were here for the talk just before lunch uh, with David Vogt, because Christina Hendricks talked quite a bit about her experience with DS106, this digital storytelling course, which is this kind of very wild, amazing thing. Again, this is kind of that idea of, um, of an open course. So I'm not going to rave too much about DS106. Um, but one of the things that's really cool about DS106 that's kind of evolved over time, and Christina showed this again, so I won't go into too much detail about it, is this idea of the assignment bank. So over time, students have actually been the ones creating assignments of different kinds. And I won't get in again because Christina talked about this stuff. This has been a very powerful thing. And what you've actually started to see in the DS106 universe is the concept of the drive-by assignment. So there are people who've never signed up for DS106. They might not even know what DS106 is, but via a Twitter link or some sort of just random Google search, they end up here. They do one or two assignments, they build their skills, they share back what they've learned, and they go away and we never see them again. Um, which is a very kind of, I think, very cool dynamic that we see. Now, what I love about the, um, the assignment bank is, first of all, this has turned into a pretty awesome open educational resource in its own right. So this past, um, this past uh, summer, we actually had Christina Hendricks and a few other people come out to Thompson Rivers University, and we did a full-day particip participatory workshop on audio production. And it was really, really fun. One of the things I was struggling with was, I don't want to just have people like, you know, hunched over and doing boring things and doing recordings. Like, I want people to have challenges that engage them and excite them. And the audio challenges, I was able to not only see ideas for activities, but I was able to see the work that came out of it. And we were able to create, or basically lift, these really great activities of that framework. So okay, yes, that's DS-106. And people go, well, DS-106 is this very singular thing. It's like nothing else in the world. Jim Groom's a lunatic. All those things are true. But um, what I find really exciting about this type of work is we're starting to see cases where the framework and the kind of techniques that we see being used in DS-106 are being used in ways that are contexts that are very, very different. So Alan Levine, again, oh man, this is just very humbling. It's, it's interesting when you're on a different machine, just little configuration things. Sorry about that. Um, Alan has basically taken the code of the assignment bank, this tool that allows students to contribute their own assignments, assign difficulty ratings, collect the assignments that are uh, submitted under that, as well as gathering all the feedback and all the process reflections and all the tutorials that get associated with that assignment. And he's basically stripped out the DS out of the DS-106 and created an assignment bank that's actually completely subject neutral. So this framework could be used using just a simple WordPress theme on a free and open source platform uh, for any type of course environment. And just my last example that I want to kind of talk about where you start to see um, things coming together um, is this idea. This is the code name of this project is Water 106. So what we see with DS 106 is an open site where people come and go as they please. You could proceed through week one through to week 16 if you want to. But you, again, if all you care about is audio production, you can just dive straight into audio production and pull that piece out. You, if you want to do a lot of reading and a lot of seeing what other people do, you can do that. You can watch video lectures if you want. Or you can dive straight into the hands-on examples and start doing the activities. 
Now, as a standalone course in itself, you might find that unsatisfying. But what about applying a concept like that, again, to a concept like water? So what he's essentially done is taking a lot of the things that make BS106 so cool, the syndication, the flexibility, the dynamic community of it, and uh, pulling in uh, sources of content from so many different places, and the assignment bank, and applied it to a concept that could actually apply in many multidisciplinary ways. So already you're starting to see resources like this being picked up in fairly um, uh, trades-oriented type water management programs, but you're also seeing it applying equally well to ecology programs. And you start to see interactions between trades programs and graduate study work in ecosystems, for example. Um, I think this is just a fantastic idea, or just a, a really fantastic and exciting piece moving forward. So again, just to kind of sum up that last piece about, um, you know, the idea of what a user innovation toolkit would look like. I think we're looking at tools, and this is Audrey Waters again, who I started by talking with. She wrote this piece for a, a talk she gave about a week ago. You know, she talks about community, open networks, sharing, a place on or offline, local expertise, local support, but using that technology to connect local learners and local expertise to the rest of the world. Caring about students, human connections, intellectual serendipity, resistance. And this is the piece I just found, you know, really inspiring idea of trying to articulate a vision through the choices of tools we make for a more just, progressive, and accessible future of higher education and technology and the choices we make. Um, and yeah, it's easy to get negative and apocalyptic when we look at the future of higher education or even of society, but the thing that I find really inspiring about the Nexus work I'm pointing to here is, is I think it has a lot of pragmatic benefits. Uh, even cooler, it's been super fun to participate in extremely rewarding, and every time you engage with it, you come out of it stronger and more capable, which is, I find exciting. And with that, I'm going to pass things off to Will. Let me see if I can figure out the computer is. Um, so how do I get out of Firefox? So I appreciate uh, being invited to, to speak today. Uh, actually, I invited myself based on a strategy of really trying to associate myself with very passionate and innovative people and inserting myself into their presentations. But, but what I'm finding is uh, I really want to hear what they have to say, so I'm going to keep my piece very short uh, once I figure out on a PC how to run the presentation. So I just wanted to follow up with a couple of conversations and threads that have been sort of formed in the last couple of days here at Open UBC. And one of the things I really do want to highlight is UBC, I, I feel, is, has been and is an innovator in the world of open education. Um, this is just a screen capture from the open.ubc site, which is uh, we're hoping will become a living catalog of all the open sort of projects going on at UBC right now. Uh, so you can go in and look at the different categories. We're also kind of hoping that some of the different ideas will cross feed each other. So somebody developing some open software might be interested in, in seeing how some open learning is being developed as well. Um, and if you're working on an open project and you haven't uh, seen it appear on that site, please do share uh, what you can do with that share link. So what makes a technology open? And what are the features or qualities of an open technology? And I'm going to throw that out to the audience just very briefly. Reusable. Reusable. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, so available to, to modify it so it can serve the purposes that you need it to serve? Excellent. Yeah. Accessible to all. Yeah. Accessible, freely available to all. I think those are all, all great answers. This is a question I like to, to throw out there a lot when I um, am speaking to people is, is what is an open technology? And I think what there is is a spectrum behind that. But these are some of the common features uh, that I see. So an open technology should support a community. And whether that community is the people who are working on developing the technology or the people who are using the technology or within the, the application itself. So if there's a technology being deployed here at UBC, can people come in and, and work as a community? Uh, it should support collaborative and active participation. So uh, in the terms of open learning, that uh, generally means can we have different people work together? Um, can we enable that through the technology? 
And sorry, when I, and I should talk about these open technologies. I'm specifically referring to open educational technologies. Uh, so it should support student ownership of content. So do students actually control how their content is? Can they, can they hold on to their content? Can they get their content out? Or can their content live in their space? Can they delete their content um, after they post it into it? Uh, it should support open sharing. And David Wiley has been mentioned several times over the last couple of days. And David Wiley uh, defines uh, the open educational resource as something that can be reused, revised, remixed, or redistributed. Does the technology support that? It, it may be an instructor's wishes that they would like to create an open resource, and they're using a technology where it's very hard for people to actually share or reuse that res resources. And then this sort of follows up with a couple of the comments. The technology should be flexible and adaptive. So are you able to use it how you need to use it or how you want to use it? And with that, uh, this is a phrase that Novak, who's, who's sitting back here and, and supports a lot of our open technology and develops a lot of our open technologies, is a phrase he uses a lot. Um, open technology should an, allow instructors and learners to be artists and not necessarily to be plumbers. So it should be flexible enough that they can, can start with the idea of how they want to teach, how they want to learn, and then the technology should adapt to that rather than having to adapt to the technology. So with that, I just want to talk very briefly about blogs, CMS, and the UBC Wiki. Uh, all trailing edge technologies, as Brian pointed out earlier. I love that phrase. Uh, but I actually think they're very powerful technologies. And there's a reason they're persistent. And there's a reason that they're centrally supported uh, learning technologies here on campus. Uh, I'm just going to provide a couple quick examples of how these three technologies can be combined or used in different ways. So let's say a faculty wants to launch an open learning project to engage the public. This is an example. Uh, we heard a little bit about this from Christina's talk earlier. So this is the Arts One Digital Project. Uh, they wanted to extend the Arts One classroom here by making some of the resources available. And I love the backstory on this. It came out from a student in one of the classes coming up to the instructor and saying, do you mind if I record your, your video? I really want to, or record your lecture. I really want to make a video of it so I can go back and rewatch the lecture. Um, so I don't have to worry about taking notes too much. And the instructors kind of said, that's a great idea. Why don't we enable that ability for all of the students? And then it became, why don't we make that available for anyone? Because our, we're the experts in this area, and our content has value. And we're going to make sure that anybody can use that content. Uh, this is just a, another example. Again, these are all using these same three technologies here at UBC, the UBC blogs, uh, UBC CMS, which are websites, and UBC Wiki. So this is David Ng's Philo Game project, where he's developing basically a um, species identification using the metaphor of Pokemon. So having kids come in and, and really work with biology um, stuff and learn traits of animals around a Pokemon metaphor. Uh, this is this changed my practice. It's an open site that is being developed by the UBC con Continuing Professional Development in the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, they're having uh, basically surgeons from around the world uh, and other medical specialists come in and say, OK, what I really learn is not necessarily all from the journals, but what I hear from my peers and what I hear from my recommendations. So it's basically an online journal club in one, in one way. So a faculty member, or sorry, a medical expert will go out and read a journal article and say, did this change my practice? Has this changing how I actually practice medicine? And they're sharing that with openly on the world. This is a, just another example. And the instructor is designing a course in a student as producer model. How many people are familiar with the student as producer? So I just want to throw this quote out because I think uh, Paul talked a little bit about this earlier, as did Christina and Paul. But uh, my favorite sort of definition of this comes from Mike Neary at the University of Lincoln, who's heading up a student as producer initiative. And he basically says the student as producer initiative is a move of having the student be the object of the educational process to being its subject. Students should not be merely consumers of knowledge, but producers engage in meaningful generative work alongside the faculty. So how do we enable technology that supports that? This is the UBC Wiki. This is a uh, instructor who's teaching a food and science course. And it, she has a great story where she moved this because she wanted to sort of engage with how science actually works. So originally, she was having people write papers. The papers were only being read by her or her TAs. Then she moved to the idea of doing a poster presentation session. So her students were coming in and writing poster presentations. And those were only being read by the other students in the class and TAs as well, and the instructors. And then after the session, after the term was done, she noticed no one ever picked up their posters. So then she used the UBC Wiki to create a knowledge base um, on food science. So she'd ask her students to come in and write formal um, sort of research articles based 
on food science. This is just a quick screenshot of a student uh, project on tofu processing. And what she found is that the quality of the work went up because this work is, is freely available on the web. Someone can Google uh, tofu processing and see this work, this, this knowledge that students produced. So instead of one, one sort of um, person or two people with a TA actually reading the work, uh, thousands of people. So I just checked the stats on this one page this morning. Uh, this page was generated this, this term and it's already been viewed 1,300 times approximately. Uh, so the power of open uh, to engage students to have actual control um, to, to actually create, or sorry, to go back to the quote, to be engaged in meaningful generative work. And this is an example of this rather than just, just a paper. So a large course wants a Twitter-like back channel to increase student to increase in-class in student engagement. So this is an example out of Sodder in their business fundamentals. Uh, they basically found that they wanted a way in these large sections for students to collaborate and to communicate. So they basically, and to also learn sort of uh, digital literacy around the idea of back channels, which are used in business quite a bit. So Twitter is a back channel. Uh, they didn't want to do Twitter because they wanted to keep it local on campus, uh, but they were, they were fine making it open. So basically, uh, the instructor in the class would, would throw out a question. What did you feel about the Netflix merger? Students would go to the back channel and start having these conversations as the class was going on. Um, so just a way to really engage with, with the class. The student wants, uh, instructor wants to demonstrate key skills and accomplishments in each So again, this is the idea of students having ownership of their work. So the student has their own space. They're putting their work out onto it. Um, and they have ownership and control of it. But in this sort of case, and, and this is actually David Vogt's class who spoke before lunch, uh, he is then taking some of their blogs and syndicating it into the class. So the students still, own, still control and own their content, uh, but it is part of the, the structured class assignment. And just to, to quickly go over another example, this is a learning module that has to be updated by a lot of people. What's really interesting about this part is they've separated the content layer from the presentation layer. So here's the presentation layer. Uh, it is a, a, a blog. It's basically doing, this is a math one, the infinite series module. It's basically a self-learning tool. Students are coming in to learn it. But the, the interesting thing is it's actually the content's being pulled from a different site. So the content's being pulled from the UBC wiki because they want people to, to find the errors, to be able to go and correct these things. Someone can update this page, and this page automatically gets updated to be correct. Um, the other power of that is, since this page lives independently, this content can be used in other areas. And it is being used in other institutions, my understanding, in Ottawa. And then uh, aggregating content from student resources. Again, coming from Sauter, he's having his students come in and interact with his colleagues and having them basically find if they're interested to have their blogs come into a, general, uh, a centralized space. So again, the idea of having students be engaged in meaningful content alongside faculty. So basically, three technologies, all essentially supported here at UBC, can do a, a large range of things. So when we talk about and another example of this, also just an example of a, a standard group blog. Lots of courses here on campus are running group, group blogs. So when it comes down to reclaiming the open learning framework, I think what it really comes down to is open technology should be enabling. It should be enabling for the faculty to do what they want to do. It should be enabling also for the students and learners to take control and ownership. Um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff. So that was very quick, so just some examples here at UBC. But what I really am excited about is to turn this over to John, who is a instructor in the Faculty of Law, who has engaged in this process with opening his course and using these tools to basically transform his on-campus course. And I'll see if I can figure out how to get your slides going. <coughs> so I, I'm going to invite you, uh, if you have a computer, which not many of you do, um, feel free to go to videogame.law.ubc. Just Google that. It'll take you to the site. And feel free to root around um, while we're talking. And I'm going to figure out where we are. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, for me because I would never in a million years think that I would be invited to talk to you. Um, and that is not false modesty, that is well-deserved modesty. Um, but I'm here uh, because of 
the iterative potential of open learning technologies and some amazing people uh, like Novak and Will who had um, patience with me um, and led me um, to a place where I've done some things that others um, find meaningful and believe me, um, nobody is more surprised um, at what's been done here uh, than me. And um, that's for real. So uh, I wrote a book in 2005 on video game law. It was the first book of its kind, um, and there's some, um, there, there, there's all sorts of interesting um, legal debate around something called law of the horse as to whether uh, a course like video game law or internet law should even be taught. Um, I'll leave that um, uh, to, to the academicians, but uh, uh, thanks to a couple of people at the Berkman Center at Harvard, um, uh, that, that argument has been won uh, in favor of these kinds of courses. Um, we're in the seventh year of the course, and the course always had a bit of an interesting spirit. The first year of the course, both UBC Law and UVic Law wanted it, so I ended up joining the two classrooms through video technology and going uh, to UVic every second week, and it actually worked um, way better than anyone expected. Um, so there, there, there is, uh, uh, because of the nature of the course and the kinds of students it attracts, uh, there, there always was a certain experimental uh, nature to it. How much time do I have just so that I can pretend that I'm honoring the deadlines? Um, 15, minutes. 15 minutes? Okay, good. Um, and what happened was I've got a background in television. I also have a background in, in sports. I was general counsel of uh, the Canucks, and I was the first general manager of VTV. Uh, which may lead you to believe that I um, uh, know something about technology. I, I really don't and didn't, um, but I did know enough about media to understand one thing and one thing only, and that is you have to be patient and that things are going to go wrong. And that's the only thing I bring to the party that I'll take any credit for is I know technology only works some of the time, so you just keep on keeping on, and it works out. Um, what happened was I was on iTunes U. I found a fantastic course that I uh, had nothing to do with law um, that I fell in love with. I watched all 24 lectures, and I thought, gee, I want to do that. Um, and I got some support from the law faculty um, who were absolutely um, wonderful. Ben Gould, who uh, is the associate dean, who's uh, who's, who's masterful and wonderful, said, yeah, go ahead and do it. I, I was at the Center for Digital Media, and Richard Smith, um, Dr. Richard Smith, uh, promised support. So kind of unbeknownst to, uh, without understanding what it really was, I decided to go ahead and try and do it. And in that context, I met the folks at CTLT, and Novak Rogic in particular said, have you ever thought of doing a blog site? And I said, no, um, I never... I know nothing about this kind of technology at all. Novak said, what do you want? We'll, we'll, we'll create one for you. I played along, and um, this is my daughter, my 11-year-old daughter's drawing, I guess she was 9 or 10 at the time, of how I originally designed the course, which was uh, the students were going to do a paper, I was going to give lectures, uh, there was a textbook, and we'd have guest speakers. And that was it. There was no um, digital notion whatsoever. Um, but I did have some goals. Uh, this is uh, uh, my wife's souffle, which I find engaging and uh, uh, does all of these things. It's, it's complex. It uh, creates a great appreciation and perspective on life, and it's very engaging. But these are my goals for the class. And... That got me to this very strange place, 
which was, this is a course about video game law. I wanted to design it like a video game. I wanted the students, there was clearly a quest here, and the quest was a great paper and great student contributions. I wanted to create an open world. If any of you are gamers, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, create a large terrain that would be navigated and explored in the student's discretion. Um, provide tools for user-generated content. Provide additional content. Um, and create some form of multiplayer. And the multiplayer part is the toughest part, and I'll talk about um, that a little bit. If you're not a gamer, you might not fully understand it, but from a, um, but, but the notion of the course, because it's essentially a two credit course, um, which is, you know, can't be too overwhelming, is to create an overwhelming amount of material, and if you go through the website, I think you'll find that there's quite a lot there, but let the students navigate it themselves for the purpose of figuring out what they want to think about and write about deeply. And that, that's really the purpose. And the website um, has allowed us to do that. So why go to the, to the web? Um, and why go open, ultimately? So. To me, if it's, if it's about engagement, engagement means interactivity. And I think I've, I've already described the metaphor of the course, which is a massively multiplayer uh, online world. And then the third point, I think, is really uh, the significant one. Um, the third and fourth points sort of live together. Um, the native language, and Brian alluded to this, um, of students is the web. Why are we trying to force them into other boxes and other boxcars? If what you want is student engagement, then we already know where they are, where they're comfortable, and it's actually an easy place to be, uh, much easier than I thought. And the, the insight that, that, I, that I had as recently as yesterday afternoon, where one of my students at the center said, can you put last week's talk that I gave at the center um, on Moodle? And I just started shaking because I don't really know how to do that. And I'm not very good at that. And I've had patient teachers, and it just doesn't really work for me. And that's so weird, given some of the things that I'm about to tell you. Um, and, and so I don't understand the, the disconnect. I, I'm sure I'm much more fearful of something that I need not fear so much, but um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, on a more from a more principled perspective, and without getting into all of my own personal history, I'll just briefly mention that really for, for all of my career, I've been a freedom of expression lawyer, and I still see myself as a freedom of expression lawyer first and foremost. Um, for law, it's, it's, it's particularly, you know, law is very conservative discipline, but openness, is a sacred principle in law. So it's not that hard to make the jump and say, you know, for legal, all legal courses should be open and they should all be online. And law schools have, if not a responsibility, at least uh, uh, should have a very strong inclination to do education um, that reaches beyond the students um, particularly because of this lovely Latin principle, which, uh, which means ignorance of the law is no excuse. So, and then the other reason is just the way the, the course works. A lot of it is about intellectual property law and about users' rights and the various balances. Um, and I guess my own 
pedagogic conclusion is, you know, there's, there's this notion of immaculate creation and ownership. You know, I thought of something and it's, uh, and it's mine and that's why it should be copyright protected. And, uh, you know, most of the research shows that actually the way we come up with ideas is all based on interconnection anyways. And it, um, it, 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 the, it tends to support other theories, which thankfully the Supreme Court of Canada is implementing around users' rights. Um, and all of that ultimately leads to Creative Commons, um, which is how the site is, is, uh, is dealt with. Um, let me briefly talk about hits and misses and try to leave you with one or two final thoughts. Um, hit number one, there's a bunch of research out there that shows that if you are going to be on video in your course, you are going to prepare a lot harder and you're going to up your teaching game. This is absolutely true. And being up at 3 o'clock in the morning, most nights before my class, proves it. And my kids saying, why are you up? And, and I am preparing, I don't know, 2,000% harder than I had for the previous 20 years where I was teaching off the side of my desk. Um, it's just that way. Um, student engagement, yes. I'll talk about some of the misses there. But one thing for sure the students notice what you put in, and they see the stakes are raised in terms of what they're expected to put in. And you don't have to say anything, and you don't have to berate anybody. If you're putting in that much effort, they know their papers have to be good. And when I started doing this, the, the quality of papers went up 70%. Um, something I'm proud of, which I'll invite you to go to the site to see is what I call the living syllabus. This year is an experiment. I took my syllabus from last year, and I found that I could um, put everything on the open website, put all of the cases, all of the papers, they were all available in, in open source formats, and the entire course, everything that the students are expected to read is actually, last year I had uh, a, a link that was only open to law students to go into the library. This year, I found I didn't even need it. Every single case, every single paper, every single thing, and there's some videos as well, um, is, is, is there. It allows me uh, incredible flexibility and iterativeness, and I no longer walk in for the first four weeks of the course with, you know, having killed two trees uh, because I'm handing out uh, new syllabuses, which I always did for the first three weeks of every semester. The other um, uh, wonderful thing others have talked about, you know, persistence. It doesn't close down. Uh, we're now in the second year of the course, um, and the community just grows, and last year's lectures are up, and this year's lectures are up, and it just keeps going. Uh, what has surprised me is the invitations I've gotten to speak uh, at Georgia Tech uh, is probably sort of the best one, where they invited me to come down. Um, Georgia Tech's a pretty serious um, technology school. They wanted me to speak. Uh, they did a wonderful job, but if the proof um, of how unusual it is for a Canadian lawyer to go down uh, to speak in the format that they allowed for me was that they had to mention in their brochure materials, in their poster materials, that even though I was a Canadian lawyer, I had a lot of relevant things to say um, to this group. Um, Mrs. Um, I don't know. Last year I didn't make it part of evaluation. This year I did. Um, uh, I, the, 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 the contributions are better this year in terms of quality, but there are less of them. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, I, I like the casual comments, and I think some of the kids are putting maybe a little too much pressure on themselves. Um, last year, we had this idea that, that, that in fact, um, it was a notion of, oh, well, let's do kind of a, uh, the, the students will film the course. and and we'll put it up on the website, and they didn't. And that might be a technological problem that we didn't really figure out an easy place for them to put the stuff and, and, and how the workflow would really work. 
Um, but that was a fail. Um, the biggest hit comes back to CTLT. Um, and, and it's a saying you guys know, give a person a fish and you feed them for a day, teach a person to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. I never knew how to do any of this stuff. Uh, what you have on the right hand side is a um, course that I'll be teaching at the law school next year called Legal Constraints on Digital Creativity. I won't bother you with exactly what the course is about. Um, but what's relevant is I built the, the website entirely myself on a weekend. And that is unfathomable. So this from someone who can't even bring himself to go on Moodle, I, I built this site in the middle of July um, for fun. I just said, gee, I wonder. I've been fooling around with this stuff so long. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got the OK to do this course. I wonder if I could try this. And I wonder if Will and Novak will be proud of me if I do. And I did. And I had some challenges, and I overcame them. And now I won't let them touch the course. I make them tell me how to make changes on the website instead of uh, doing any of that. Um, my one comment on the pedagogic stuff here is I, I think a lot of the focus in open learning is too vertical. It's, a, it's about you know, professor and student. My experience, and the evidence is actually all out there, um, is that students learn horizontally. They learn a lot more from each other than we give them credit for. And until we figure out ways that allows them to do something as simple as two students making one blog contribution together in real time, we're not going to get to where we need to go. And um, this is, and I'm evidence of it, easy. It's not hard, because if I can do it, trust me, anybody can. Um, and there are lots of good reasons to do it. But I want to leave you, oh, and you start doing research about what really works. And, I, and there's this wonderful piece that says, well, when you're, when, you're, um, when you're trying to communicate on the web, make sure you have a cat picture. So um, I, I, I do that. But I, I want to just tell one very brief story if I have one minute. It's, in a way, you'll think it has nothing to do with any of this. And I'm going to suggest it has everything to do with it. Um, this week, the Law Society of Upper Canada released a report. Uh, that was done by a number of academics in Ontario. And the issue was why, after all of these years of trying to support the, a meaningful role for women in law and in law firms in the Law Society of Ontario and throughout Canada and likely throughout the world, has that not really happened? In fact, never mind that has it not really happened. It hasn't happened. And there's lots of empirical data to show that it hasn't happened. And there's been tons of lip service, and there have been tons of efforts, and there have been tons of programs, and why hasn't it happened? And the study made one core point. And that was that law firms were thinking about the promotion of women as being good for business. They were looking for a business rationale when they had to look at, for, look at it from the point of principle and, what's, and doing what's right. And the one thing I would urge academic institutions to do with all of the talk of MOOCs and um, and systems and all of this stuff that I don't know that much about is look at it from the point of principle rather than um, what you think of as your business. The point of principle is what do students learn from and how do they learn best. And if we stick to that rather than what are they called? Learning management systems. No, learning systems. 
That's the point of principle. If we deviate too much from that point of principle, we will almost certainly go wrong. Thank you very much.